Hello, everyone. Welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. Today, I will be talking to Bill Ziegler from the Chicago Zoological Society, which operates the Brookfield Zoo. He is the Senior Vice President of Animal Programs, and he's in charge of the animal collections and care at the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago. And as my guest today, Bill is here to talk about pangolins. We've previously discussed pangolins on one of our podcasts. Remember, not to be confused with penguins. These are pangolins, and they are the most trafficked animal in the world. Okay, more than rhino horn or elephant tusks. Uh, these little guys are in big trouble. And so Bill's going to be here today to discuss a lot about what they've been doing at the Brookfield Zoo for their conservation of white-bellied treed pangolins. A few years ago, the zoo welcomed a group of white-bellied tree pangolins as part of an initiative launched with a handful of other zoos and conservation groups to save this animal, and since it's been identified as the most trafficked creature in the whole world. So I'm very, very excited to have Bill here today. He's from my old stomping grounds of the great Windy City, Chicago. So thank you, Bill, and welcome. Well, thank you. It's uh, nice to join uh, this podcast, and, and it's nice to hear your voice again. I know we met a few months ago and had a long discussion, so um, it's it's good to connect again. It is. Well, and uh, I'm just so pleased to have met you and that to, sh to hear the story about what uh, Brookfield Zoo is doing to help the pangolins, and we want to get the message out there because... Since the pangolin is not as well known or as large or grandiose as, say, a rhino or an elephant, which they need our help too, of course. Uh, but the pangolin, I think, uh, the the biggest thing that can help them is just educating people about what they are and how to help them. So, uh, and you you being an expert in Brookfield Zoo, really launching this initiative to save these guys is it's just an honor to have you here today. So, can you? Give our listeners um, just a little brief background about yourself. Well, I'll, I'll give away my my age almost. I've I've been in this profession, the zoological <laughs> profession, for uh, for about forty four years now. Um, I actually started in Miami, Florida, on a on Key Biscayne in a little zoo called Crandon Park, uh, but. That institution uh, changed, and in 1980, uh, we were in the midst of building a new zoo called, at that time, Metro Zoo. Now it's called Zoo Miami. Oh, wonderful, uh, yeah. And that was down in Perrine, Florida. So I became involved with the build-out of that facility and the design of the exhibits, and then eventually I transferred the entire collection from Crandon Park down to the new zoo site, and then manage the collection, the staff, the conservation programs, our science work for 21 years uh, down there. Then, uh, then I actually retired. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I retired. <laughs> I, I took an opportunity from the county, and I moved to Ocala, Florida, where I bought a horse farm. And I, I breed. See, uh, I, kn I knew I liked you. You and oh, I yeah. have that in common. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was breeding Arabians for endurance racing, uh, which is basically not racing around a track, but we do 50 and 100 mile uh, uh, trots, you might call it. Uh, and I had a lot of people started contacting me for advice, and eventually um, I created a company with my wife, and um, we began consulting with zoos and aquariums uh, in fundraising, board development, exhibit design, uh, collection management, uh, a number of other services, uh, which is how I got involved with Brookfield Zoo in that the CEO, uh, Dr. Stuart Strahl, was the president at the time of Florida Audubon. And okay. uh, our company contracted with him to do the, most of their fundraising and when he left Audubon to come to uh, the Chicago Zoological Society, uh, he asked us to get involved in a capital campaign they were doing up here. And one thing led to another, and uh, <laughs> I became involved with Brookfield Zoo as a full-time employee. As you said, I'm in charge of the animal programs. So that's what I've been doing. And um, it's been a lot of fun. It's I've seen a lot of changes over the over 40 years in the industry. 
Oh, uh, I can't even. I I can't even imagine. I bet you have some of the most amazing stories. I will. In a in a different time, we'll have to get together because I I would love to hear uh, just in my brief tenure uh, in the zoo industry, just even seeing the witnessing the changes when I was there for seven years are very impressive and exciting. And I, I just bet you could, you could probably write a really good book. <laughs> well, we, we had a lot of adventures uh, in building that zoo down there. Obviously, there were a lot of uh, things going on at the time, a lot of new things that we were doing down there, uh, new, new ways of approaching uh, animal management and exhibit design. So, yeah, and, and of course, uh, during this whole period, there's, the science has advanced, the exhibitry has advanced, and, uh, you know, our our position in the world of conservation has changed, too. And I think that's been very crucial uh, for our institutions and for conservation in general. We're one of the largest uh, providers, the zoological profession, <clears throat> of funding for conservation programs in the field. And uh, it's been the dedication of uh, zoological people, um, people that work in zoos, uh, that has really brought that about and has been such a critical part of conserving nature and wildlife. So I've been very blessed. It's one of those jobs where uh, it's not a job, if you know what I mean. It's, <laughs> I do, uh, yeah. You know, you enjoy it so much. You Every day you get up and you go, well, what am I going to get done today? You know, it's it's not like going <clears throat> into an office and sitting down and doing the same thing every day. And so that's been a blessing for me anyway, uh, in that every day there's something new. I'm still learning, obviously, uh, as we go along. And um, it's just an exciting profession to be in. Well, and is that one of the reasons you were convinced to come out of retirement was because of all the exciting movements and growth that's happening in the field of, of zoological sciences and education? Uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> obviously doing the consulting with uh, institutions, we saw a lot of things going on. But when Dr. Straw contacted me, uh, he, he actually did so, uh, and we talked about creating a uh, a culture change here at Brookfield Zoo in how we approached animal management. I've, mm -hmm. I've always, uh, I don't want to, I don't like the term, I always go outside the box, but I've always been a person that has wanted to push the boundaries and limits of what we can do. And so I came in and my first, uh, my first goal was to create what I call welfare 24-7, um, 365. Um, you know, welfare is the highest priority that we have for the animals under our care. And uh, I saw a lot of things going on that I felt needed to be improved. Uh, and I also felt that um, people were approaching it uh, where welfare was a part of their job during the day and then they went home and okay, nothing, yeah. nothing occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, and this animal or these animals, they, they live in our environments uh, 24 seven. And so it's our responsibility morally and ethically to provide them with sound welfare around the clock, not just while staff are here. And so that means looking at a number of different things and how we approach, uh, the exhibit interaction with the animal, how we approach food interaction and food delivery, uh, and Looking at the environment and being able to adjust the environment for each uh, exhibit that we have in order to help create a randomness, you might say, uh, mm -hmm. in the exhibits. You know, these animals, when they get up every day in, in the wild, they, they're not really sure what's going to happen. They don't know. Sure, there's not a routine, right? Yeah, there's not a routine. They don't know where they're going to find their food or, you know, if they're going to have to defend their territory that day. And so... Being able to create a better um, environment for them meant creating some randomness and uh, getting back. Also, I, I felt nutrition had kind of gone astray in that, uh, you know, in the, in the mid 80s and, and uh, through the early 90s, there were a lot of products that were developed. Great products, don't get me wrong. Sure. Mm -hmm. But they were processed foods and, you know, right. kind of like dog food. One, one mm -hmm. can of dog food does it all. And, and I felt that that uh, wasn't really, to me, that's not a good approach. And I saw a lot of obese animals, animals that had too much weight on them, 
and we were sort of loving them to death, if you will, <laughs> kind, of, kind of like your pet, you know. Right. Oh, yes. And, and if people would look at animals in the wild, you don't see that kind of weight on animals. Uh, oh, and part of, no, especially no. during the dry season or the, you know, the non-rainy season. They, they often uh, look very thin and Absolutely. Yes, not... You're not like you see them um, when they're living under human care, that's for sure. Right. They they can't carry that extra weight and escape prey, predators <laughs> or, you know, you can't catch prey when you're overweight. So exactly. It was uh, getting animals back to working for a living in our institution and getting away from processed foods. Our goal right now is in the next five years is to uh, reduce processed foods by about uh, 40%. And wow. Wow. Get back that to whole is... foods. We, we've gone to whole carcass feeding for our carnivores. We've gone to... That's Here's the awesome. other thing, too, is that, uh, you know, when you when I was looking at what zoos were doing, uh, ADF is a pelletized uh, herbivore diet that you give to, like, antelope and gazelles and, and, and cattle. Uh, and they would be feeding ADF-16 all year long. Well, right. you know, it's like you just said. There are droughts. There's, there's mm-hmm. rainy seasons. And so the quantity and the quality of the food changes throughout the year and so it's like, absolutely right mm-hmm. so why are we feeding the same food all year long that doesn't make sense to me so well yeah and i i think that uh even certain species of animals their uh reproductive cycles and health are based upon um nutritional dynamic nutritional changes I've often wondered if some of the reproductive issues we see in certain species of at least hoofstock animals, which is more of my forte, isn't due to the fact that we are yet overfeeding them or they have an overnutrition and that they're not getting these physiological cues of seasonality um, with their diet. But it's it's, it's hard to say without, without really, really studying it, but I do think that a lot of times when they're living under human care, that the diet does not come, it might nutritionally wise mimic what they're getting in the wild, but the amount um, or the variety is, uh, is yeah, not necessarily the best for their, for their physiology. I, oh, I would agree. I mean, all you have to do is extrapolate from humans. And, mm-hmm. you know, when, when, you, when you're a couple and you're trying to have a child, you know, what's the doctor tell you? He says, get healthy, eat the right foods. Absolutely. Um, you know, lose weight. These, these type of things interfere with the reproductive cycles. So we've gone to seasonal diets now. And our, like our hoofstock, for example, we have four different diets that we feed. Uh, That's through, awesome. Throughout the year, depending upon the seasons. And, you know, you want to be able to have a good, rich season where you're conditioning the females to ovulate, to go, th- go through pregnancies and to lactate. Um, and that requires different energy levels uh, compared to in the fall uh, or in a dry season where you then you've got to reduce that amount of fat and fiber and protein because it's just not something that needs to be there all year long. So we've we've done that. We're taking that approach. We do it with seasonal uh, produce as well as fruit for our primates. In fact, right now we're just finishing up our seasonal diets for all of our primates as well. So these are just some of the things that I looked at when I when I talk about welfare twenty four seven three sixty five. It's it's taken a very very broad holistic look at the animal, their environment, and what we're doing in order to make sure that we're providing the best care possible. Well, Bill, that's just so wonderful to hear. It's such a progressive approach, and I definitely think that the Brookfield Zoo should be applauded for that. And I know that uh, more institutions are getting on board with things like this, and it's just a really, really exciting time uh, as far as, in my opinion, if you're being part of a zoological industry. Now, for our listeners I promise we're going to jump into pangolins here in the near future, but I think this is so important because uh, for me, uh, Bill is such an icon that (laughs) this interview might even be more for me than the listeners, in fact, as I love hearing about this and he has such a history and he has such an in-depth knowledge about the industry. Uh, And so, but one of the things I really haven't touched on too much in the podcast is uh, a lot of the zoological institutions I have mentioned are AZA accredited, and some of them are even becoming humane certified. 
And I always encourage listeners um, to look for that when they are visiting a zoological uh, institution and make sure that the zoo is quote unquote AZA accredited. So I wondered, Bill, since you are an expert and you've been in the industry uh, for many years, which I don't think date your, dates yourself. It's like, doesn't doesn't wine get better with age or something like that, right? <laughs> oh, you're you're so kind. <laughs> <laughs> but for our listeners, can you uh, just briefly describe what it means for the Brookfield Zoo to be AZA accredited um, and humane certified, and how that separates uh, how that separates your institution from others? Well, of course, uh, AZA accreditation is what we call the gold standard for zoological parks and aquariums. It is, it's a crucial part of our industry. It main, it helps us maintain a level of excellence within the association um, th- that puts us beyond a lot of other organizations out there, roadside zoos, menageries, uh, because we, it means we seriously take a look at. Uh, how we're conducting ourselves, the ethics and, and morality of, of the animal care. Accreditation goes beyond that as well. It also covers how we perform for our guests, what we give our guests in amenities and the quality of the guest experience. Uh, but it looks at financial obligations as well, uh, that the institution is financially sound and can provide the resources, the tools and the equipment and all that's required in order to maintain these animals. And of course, that we we maintain the highest zoological uh, standards uh, in our exhibitry, uh, that we continue to work on advancing uh, our institutions and the science of animal welfare. So this is what the accreditation process looks at. And um, it, it's to me, it's, it's one of the critical factors uh, in an institution. And it's been recognized worldwide, obviously, and it's even recognized by our government. We're inspected by uh, the U.S. Department of, of Agriculture under the Animal Plant and Health Inspection Service, a- acronym called APHIS, and they recognize the fact that if we're AZA accredited, that we are a step above most other institutions in the quality of our programs, the quality of our animal care uh, and our ability to care for the animals. Um, so it, it, it is recognized, and we think it's, it's valuable. Uh, even Fish and Wildlife Service recognizes our accreditation program through the, our zoo association in that if we're accredited, uh, obtaining permits for certain things are a little bit easier because they know the high standards that we maintain. So I, th- I think that's crucial. The humane certification, we were the first zoo in the U.S. and the world, for that matter, to be certified oh, wh- as humane. Um, wow, I didn't know that. That congratulations, that's oh, awesome. Oh yeah, and and to me, that's a critical part too. Now, it doesn't supersede AZA accreditation by any means, right? Because mm-hmm. humane certification looks solely at animal welfare, whereas accreditation not only looks at animal welfare, but it looks at all of our other functions. Uh, but humane certification, a, a team of independent reviewers come in, and they'll spend four to five days out in the collection, looking at everything, observing animals. Um, Whoa, really hands-on, yeah. Very much hands-on, and they have a very extensive uh, booklet, or I, I call it a booklet, or a Bible, if you will, that they go through and evaluate each species that's there in each of, each of our programs. So to me, that's a, that's a supplement uh, to the accreditation process, and it's sort of like... Um, you could call it getting the good housekeeping seal of approval. Um, sure. And of well, course, and I, go ahead. Oh, well, I just think it just goes to show that how zoos are always trying to even improve upon what they already have. Like it started off with AZA accreditation and then more recently, is it in the last five years, a, a humane certification? Uh, three years. Three years. So, I mean, for me, it just goes to show how zoos are just, keep raising the bar, if you will. Well, and certain zoos. And that's our drive. That's that's our uh, responsibilities and you know, that's our mission and that's also uh, uh quite frankly, that's the mission of the AZA is that we continue to mm-hmm. advance the science of zoological parks and aquariums. Uh so yeah, this is one I, step. 
Yeah. And I have to tell you, I went through um, an AZA accreditation while I was at my zoo in Chicago and it is no joke. Um, and like you said, it's all aspects of, of the zoo. So not just the, um, not just the people in charge, but the animal keepers, we were involved with it. We were interviewed for it. Um, and we probably started preparing, uh, for the inspection, uh, at least a year, if not more in advance on, on just our animal care end of things. So it is, it is, a, and it, and the accreditation happens every five years. And it just goes to show that it's not a one-time accreditation and then the institution's never looked at again. Uh, it's every five years and it's very, it's very, at least for my being from being a keeper for my end, it, it, it was, it was, it's very diverse and, uh, the bar is set really high and it just, for me, it just set a good example for, from an animal care point of view of, uh, what good care we were giving. And so, absolutely. Uh, well, good. Well, thank you for that, that definition. Cause I know I've, I've never really taken the time to go over it for the listeners and, uh, you, you live, eat and breathe it. So <laughs> I really yeah, oh, yeah. appreciate In that. In fact, we, we do, uh, <laughs> even though it's every five years, uh, I run our animal program collection staff and facilities through what I, what we call a mock inspection every year. Oh, wow. Okay, man. So, boy, your poor keepers are always on edge, Bill. Well, no, it's just, you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, we don't, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to just look nice once every five years. So No, I know. I'm just totally, I, I'm, I'm just teasing. I know. No, it's good. It's definitely good. Um, and now just switching gears, and I really want to dive into what uh, the work that the Brookfield Zoo has been doing for pangolins and pangolin conservation. So just to get the listeners a quick reminder, would you be able to give a brief description of a pangolin, um, what they look like, where they live, and what they eat? Sure. Uh, I mean, if you look at, uh, it's funny, I've always tried to figure out what animal I would compare a a pangolin to, and I finally decided um, I would compare it to a squirrel in the shape of the body with the large back hips, but it has a more pointed snout. And then it has the tail, a prehensile tail like a monkey, but it's all covered in scales. Um, <laughs> right. It's crazy. Uh, or if you, you know, think of a ferret, but a ferret with very big back hips and, and legs. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. All, That's good. I like that. All covered in scales. Uh, there, there's eight species of pangolin, though, and they range anywhere from a few pounds in size up to 60 pounds <clears throat> uh, in, in weight. The giant pangolin in Africa can weigh up to 60 pounds. It's, it's, it can be quite a hefty animal. Most of the pangolins, though, are smaller. They'll weigh anywhere between three to seven pounds, uh, maybe a little bit bigger than that, depending upon which one. Uh, there's four species uh, in Asia and there's four species in Africa. So um, it's it's quite a diverse group in terms of size, but they all are very easily to characterize in that they are all covered in scales, except on their stomach. Oh, uh, their stomachs just have the skin right. exposed? Yeah, the skin's uh-huh. exposed on the stomachs. So. Um, and you know that's that has to do not only with the fact that it allows them better mobility, uh, but it also deals with uh, nursing of young and and uh, mm-hmm. being able to care for the uh, for uh, the uh, offspring. Yeah, armadillos are somewhat similar. Uh, one of my one of my favorite education animals at the zoo was a little three banded armadillo named Meatball, but she was small in size and she couldn't actually roll all the way up into the into the tight ball and i think because of that or because being an education animal she loved her little soft belly scratched like a dog and it was and she would ask for it and it was a way when we were doing training sessions to reinforce her and yeah i definitely fell in love with the armadillos after that and and the armadillos have the shell whereas pangolins have they're the only mammal with scales and which is just so fascinating and but interestingly enough the scales are made of keratin similar to something like rhino horn so it's just like almost like thick fingernail is that a, a good way to describe it bill uh, yeah and, and unfor- yes that's right and unfortunately it's the it's the scales that have uh caused this group of animals the most uh the most issues 
people think that these scales, if ground up and added to water or other things, obviously have uh, medicinal purposes, which it doesn't, just like the rhino horn. Uh, it, it doesn't really do anything, but I've seen products sold with pangolin scales supposedly in them that would cure insomnia or cure migraines or upset stomachs or, you know, a host of, of ailments. And it's a very firm belief throughout Asia and Southeast Asia that that is the case. And and unfortunately, um, because of that, most of the, the four species of pangolin in Asia are critically endangered right now. There are very few left because they've been hunted for that reason. And then the other, uh, the other reason in Asia why they're hunted is also for pets. Um, believe it or not, some of these animals do calm down and do tend to uh, have personalities. Uh, and so the, the traditional medicine usage and for pet usage uh, has really hammered the Asian species of pangolin. In Africa, and now that the Asians are there and logging concessions, gold mines and other things and discover that they have pangolins as well, uh, they're being taken and shipped over to Asia. But also, pangolin have been a bushmeat item in Africa for a long time. And it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's difficult to change these type of things because they're very t- steeped in culture. Uh, sure. And so uh, getting folks to realize that, you know, you can't collect them for their scales and then uh, the, the pressure on them in their bushmeat markets uh, have just been absolutely incredible that they are, like you mentioned earlier, they are the world's most trafficked animal. And just in the last two years alone, uh, you know, uh, we've had confiscations of uh, three and four thousand pounds of just scales Wow, that is in- crazy. So you can imagine the number of animals that uh, had, I mean, the, a pangolin averages about 900 scales. And uh, if you took all the scales off a pangolin, it might weigh maybe maybe a pound at the most. Uh, so the number of pangolins that are being taken just for their scales to be, uh, to be shipped to Asia is just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and this is what this is what got our attention, obviously. Uh, we began talking about this program uh, back in 2014 and what was going on with pangolin and, and what could we do. And we realized right away that when it came to the African species uh, and the particular one that we're dealing with, the white belly tree pangolin, um, there's very little known about this species. We have no idea what is actually required in its habitat. We do know that they have been found in oil palm plantations and coca plantations. Uh, yeah, they've been found in um, uh, disturbed habitat, secondary forest. But we don't know what they really require uh, in space. We don't know social dynamics. We're not sure how they really communicate. We knew nothing of disease issues that we may be introducing to the areas as man moves in with these with these pets and so on. Uh, we knew nothing of reproductive physiology, uh, how long the gestation period was for a white-bellied pangolin. None of this was known, and yet here's this animal being... Uh, harvested out of the forest and out of the habitat at an incredible so, rate oh absolutely so we we sat down and talked about it here and said you know what we don't think this is something that we should wait on uh, until the last minute uh, when you look at some of the programs that we're involved with like the california condor and black-footed ferret and uh Bally Mina and some of these others uh, zoos really weren't looked at or called upon until the last minute Sure. when you were down to that 12th hour, so to speak. And unfortunately, then the animals are so reduced in numbers that not only do you have a skewed demographic uh, population, but you have a genetic population that uh, has little genetic variability in it. And so when you try to build those populations back up after they've gotten that low, you're immediately dealing with uh, a genetic issue. Um, 
and you, you get into inbreeding and you can create an inbreeding depression or a genetic bottleneck. Uh, so we said, you know, why should we wait that long to find out about that animal? And of course, we also sat down and listed what were the things that we could provide in knowledge that the field biologists would need that they can't provide. Correct. Well, and, and I, and I always think that that's an important point as far as uh, promoting conservation is wonderful in uh, saving forests and lands or whatever type of habitat the animal needs. But as you suggested, if we don't know about their biology or how much space they need uh, or what their range is or what the reproduction rates are, or their generation in- interval, it's hard to guess on those things uh, about what space they need. So I think that that's very important to, yeah, not put the cart before the horse and just start saving all this space for them or not enough space for them without understanding anything about basically their natural biology. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, in the countries of origin, there were a number of organizations, uh, rehab facilities, where they uh, where they have confiscated animals that were still alive mm-hmm. and tried to rehab them back to the wild and you know we we looked at that as well and said well what can we do there to help and so understanding the physiology looking at disease looking at nutrition mm-hmm. um, those are critical factors to rehab an animal to a point where they can be released again and so we've spent the last two years uh, working on new diets in fact we've created a, a new diet compared to what all other ant eaters and insect eaters were getting in zoos and parks uh, around the world we created a whole different diet now and um Originally, we were told that we wouldn't be able to accomplish this, that we couldn't bring animals in, we would lose them, they would all die. Um, In fact, uh, we brought 45 animals in in 2016. Uh, There was only one death during that period of time, and and that was because of a prior injury to the animal. Uh, But this new diet that we've developed uh, has really... Uh, helped us and has brought about uh, some new information on um, the nutritional requirements of the animals. So we spent the last two years since we've had our animals here uh, really not only looking at uh, behavior, social dynamics, and and physiology, but looking at diet requirements. Uh, So we've been very successful. Uh, Essentially what we did in 2015 is we formed a consortium. Okay, yeah. Uh, And we talked to a number of institutions and invited a number of institutions to join us. Um, Six of them have. Uh, We have uh, basically uh, five other zoological parks and one nonprofit organization that's not a zoological park that uh, became members of the consortium. And that's the group that went ahead and financed the... uh, the return to Africa, and we actually went to a country called Togo, which is on the western coast of Africa. That's where the animals were found, and began working there in Togo with the university as well as uh, going out in the field. And and almost all the animals that we uh, obtained were animals that had already been gathered. In in Togo, unlike a lot of the other countries where there's a huge uh, pressure on the animals, where you have Actually, you have Chinese merchants coming into villages and offering to buy animals. Uh, Togo wasn't quite like that just yet. Um, The animal was still more of a subsistence use where the local farmer would come across one in the field and gather it up. And and then that weekend they would have, you know, uh, meat for their their weekend meals. Yeah, bush Uh, meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, most of our animals were actually kind of rescued from that uh, from that situation. Very and, cool. Um, and we didn't purchase them either. That was the other thing that we worked on. We we actually traded for animals. We traded goats and other things that wow, would wow, uh, that is so kind of f- take the plate. Well, we didn't want to create a market. Sure, and, no, uh, that's just so clever yeah. and um, and very obviously very planned and. Um, yeah, just kudos to the Brookfield Zoo. That is a very smart well, it, strategy. It, it wasn't just Brookfield. It was a team effort. And That's the individual true. who was over there, 
uh, that belongs to the nonprofit, uh, he actually spent uh, two to three months over there during this whole time conditioning animals okay. uh, that were obtained. And actually, we let go a number of animals. Uh, if it looked like the animals weren't going to transition well onto the new diet, mm -hmm. or if it looked like they just weren't acclimating to being around people, they were taken back out into the area they were found and let go. Okay, um, yeah. So we, we only took those animals that we felt transitioned well uh, to our habitat. So that was another thing that we looked at, uh, was making sure that the specimens were... Uh, the right specimens to bring back. Oh, Bill, and I'm dying to ask about this diet that you've had a lot of success with because I do know in in the literature or it was commonly known that the pangolin was one of the toughest animals to keep under human care because they are insectivores that consume mostly ants and termites in the wild and that historically when they've been in a captive setting, they just have not done well on the man-made diets. But here you, the pangolin consortium came in and had this new diet and i'm just wondering you don't have to give away all your recipe but i, I just wonder if you could touch on <laughs> don't don't give away your uh, your uh, trademarks quite yet um but i'm just wondering if you could touch on what makes it so successful if it's more like processed or is there actually insects in it well um you know, previously, uh, let's look at the history uh, of what's going on with insectivores like ant e giant anteaters, tamanduas, silky anteaters, and, and so on, uh, echidnas. The diets have basically been what I, when I first was in the in the zoological profession, uh, we just called it a gruel. <laughs> uh, it was a combination of some processed food, milk, and honey. And uh, a few insects ground up in it because insects weren't really available on a mass right, market in scale. Bulk, yeah, uh, <clears throat> and it, yeah, and it had like egg in it for protein. And unfortunately, that type of diet spoils uh -huh. very quickly. Um, but it it was a kind of a soupy thing. And I think what you have to remember is these animals have this beautiful long tongue, right? And its purpose it's is very to very long. Gather up very ants. long. <laughs> yes to gather up ants and insects and they they're not slurping up a gruel they're they're gathering these individual animals onto their tongue now they mm -hmm. do drink water but uh so we said you know first of all this is probably the wrong consistency sure. uh to give these animals and the other thing is you know when these diets first came out in the 80s and 90s like i said there was very few products available uh that were part of a uh, Insect-based mm -hmm. product, and and here's where I have to give heads up and a thanks to the uh, reptile and herpetological industry, because of what they've done over the years in creating uh, and and developing ways to farm certain mm -hmm. insects, uh, whether it's grub worms, meal worms, uh, silk wax worms, worms uh, crickets, uh, you know, wax worms, everything, crickets, and all this. So now there, there's a huge amount of uh, these products available compared to what there was 10 or 15 years ago. So <clears throat> what we did was um, we tried to take a look at what these insects would have. And in fact, we actually brought ants back from Africa. Oh, wow. Uh, we brought them back. We, we taught the, a couple of the villagers how to prepare them. And they collected ants for us, and we brought back quite a few kilograms of ants when we first brought these animals in. But we were able to take that that product and break it down and analyze it to try and come up with uh, a nutritional uh, formula to to actually start from. And we we built it from that point forward. And so, and the other thing that we found out about it was people don't think about this, but like, you know, we talked earlier about the quality and quantity of food and how it changes during mm -hmm. the season. Well, you know, actually the quality and quantity of ants and other insects change during the season because they're just as affected by the environmental changes oh, as so anything else. So interesting, of course. It makes so much sense. But yeah, I'd never, never yeah. really thought about that. So an ant during one season may be a good food substance, but then, say, during the dry season, maybe right. it isn't, and the, and the pangolin move off to a different species. So we began gathering all these different types of insects that were available commercially, and we've, we've 
bought ants from China and from around the world. And like you said, all the things that we could get here. And our diet now, instead of being this gruel with maybe 5% insects, is really almost 75% insects. Wow. Uh, then we, we've added uh, a number of products to make sure we were getting the right amount mm-hmm. of fiber, uh, you know, from the, the basically the keratin in the shell of, of these insects. We wanted to get the right fiber mix and the right uh, ash and protein mix, too. <clears throat> but the one thing that we decided to do was not create a gruel. So what we did was we gelatinized it and dried it so it became a crumble. Interesting. And now we can take that product and we put them in special feeders that we're developing uh, that makes the animal exercise like they would in the wild for their for their food. And their tongue picks up the crumble. And that's more of a natural feeling sure, to them. Sure, sure. So they have to... Yeah. Not work for it, but they have to reach for and basically engage in a natural behavior. Right, and and this uh, this is this has actually served us quite well. We've been very successful with it, uh, and also to the point from the nutritional standpoint that you know we've had seven successful births so far, and we congratulations. Now have, that is well incredible. Be, before you say that, I will I will verify that they were from pregnant females that came in. Okay, okay, but still. But since then, and this is when they first came in, we've had those mm-hmm. births. We were successful. We learned a lot about uh, fe- uh, fetal development, and we now have a gestation period of about seven to eight months that we feel very comfortable with, which wasn't known before. Um, and we also know about the weaning process and the mother-infant relationship because we've had a number of these things to observe. But now I can tell you that we've verified that we have five pregnant females. <gasps> and oh, yay. I just got goosebumps. That is so exciting, yes. Bill. This this will be the first uh, birth in a zoological park of a pangolin that has actually been bred in our parks, our, our facilities. So it is actually a captive uh, breeding and uh, birth. So uh, that's that's exciting, but it also tells us that we're meeting the nutritional requirements of the female. Uh, we're meeting the environmental requirements that would allow them to uh, go through their cycles, mm-hmm. uh, and and these these are all good positive signs. Oh that yeah, we're on the and right you're track. obvious sure, and you're and you're meeting the requirements of the juveniles because I'm sure that that's going to be a little bit different too once they get weaned, well pre-weaning and then post-weaning and yeah, that's just it's really exciting and it's I think it's a a huge huge step uh in the right directions for like you said for breeding them under human care and hope getting some of those numbers up and and being able to learn more about them which will inevitably help them in the wild, for sure. Yes. And what we're doing right now is uh, this August, we're conducting our first international uh, symposium. And we've uh, invited uh, people from Africa, field researchers and rehabbers. We've invited a number of Asians who have worked with the animals under their care uh, to come to Brookfield Zoo in August. And we're going to try and sit down and take a look at our programs and see what we can do to develop uh, to develop better collaborative programs between all of our organizations, and then how the XC2 program can benefit or better benefit uh, the NC2 efforts that are going on in Asia and in Africa. And that'll be this fall. So hopefully this information that we're learning, we're going to be able to, to share at this symposium, and right after that we'll begin doing our publications uh, on this information, and and this is a, again, this is a partnership. This is a group of seven total, including Brookfield, institutions that have come together. Uh, we manage these animals as one. Our uh, animal care staff are in constant contact. Our veterinary care staff are in constant contact with each other at all the institutions, and it, it's become a very cohesive group of people that have worked very closely together on developing the new science and and identifying the needs for this particular species. And the one thing that I'll stress here the most is, uh, because some people have raised concerns about what we're doing, 
and and perhaps uh, promoting uh, pangolin farms, and that is not what we're doing. Uh, we do not believe that there should be pangolin farms to commercialize this animal. Uh, we didn't act on this to commercialize the animals. In fact, only two institutions are exhibiting uh, the pangolin, and each of those institutions waited a year after they had them before they put them on exhibit. Uh, so that's the other thing is the, the science that we're creating, we want to give that to uh, the field biologists, the researchers. We want to give it to other institutions, uh, zoological, that are housing the animals to help their programs. But we're not uh, at all supportive and we would not... Uh, we would not get involved or support efforts to farm pangolins, uh, either XC2 or NC2. Sure, yeah. And I I mean, I think that's some often a misnomer in general that people have sometimes about um, zoos and, and the different uh, species as, as far as they don't understand that a lot of the missions behind the different species that are on exhibit or living under human care, it is it is for conservation purposes to conserve their genetics should they go extinct in the wild, also to learn about the science behind them to better promote uh, saving their natural environment. And I just hope that uh, a lot of people listen to this and um, really understand that it's, of course, zoos are there for entertainment purposes and in education, but there's a lot of conservation and science that is going on more than the average person could ever begin to imagine. And I just really have to apl applaud the Pangolin Consortium for working together because I believe that for some of these species, especially internationally, well, even nationally here in the States with examples like the Red Wolf, uh, there's going to have to be a lot of different groups of people coming together to brainstorm, strategize, implement, work together, uh, provide funding for these species in order to help save them in the wild. It's not just going to be a, a, a one organization or a one person uh, act. It's going to take a lot of teamwork. And, and it just sounds like you guys are well on your way of doing that with the pangolin. And f for me, that's just very exciting. Well, I, I think you bring up a, an interesting point that needs to be discussed and, and people need to realize about conservation. You know, it, there's, a, there's a proprietorship or ownership of species by their countries of origin. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there, there should be, to an extent, especially countries need to be proud of, of the wildlife and nature that they have. But when you're dealing with a situation where the primary issues with that species survival uh, is because of pressures from outside the country or from around the other side of the world, um, right. you have to realize that it's no longer a, a country of origin issue. It's a global issue. Global, and, absolutely. And you can't solve a global problem in one way. You've got to bring together all the available resources, all that you can uh, to to create the pressures and the change, the cultural change, whatever it may be, uh, to deal with that issue on a global basis. And so the idea that one country can solve the problem or one organization can solve the problem anymore is just, it's really outdated. We're, we're too small of a world now. Correct, and, yeah. Um, we, we all have to come together on this. We all have to collaborate. We all have to, to join our our efforts together and there's always been a um, there's always been a division between field work and professional care work and mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately it has created issues in the past and it's also slowed down progress uh, when it comes to conservation of certain species because you know there, there's just a feeling from uh, the wildlife biologists out there that zoos have no purpose in conservation and they can't solve the problem um, and you know when it when you talk about education and, I, and this is why I bring this up I, I know this is kind of a long-winded answer here but when you talk about education and entertainment 
Independent surveys and studies now have shown that anywhere between 70 and 80 percent of learned science is no longer occurring in schools. It's occurring in zoological parks and aquariums and museums and, and outside the school realm. Sure, and absolutely. Hands-on activities. And, absolutely. Yeah, taking part of it. Mm-hmm. So what zoos can do in reaching people, and that's the other thing we, we have told the, the Pangolin Specialist Group, uh, our, our seven organizations have an immediate reach of about 6 point million people <clears throat> just in membership. And wow, if, well, let me repeat that number. That was 6.2 million? Is that what? 7.6 million. 7.6 million, that's incredible. And that's in memberships now. If, uh-huh. if you look at the communities that they come from, uh-huh. in other words, the entire uh, city or urban area they come from, we have a reach of about 17 million people. Wow. And then, yeah. yeah. That's what it's all about. Absolutely. And then, if you take that and say, if we can work through our association, just here in North America, the, the Association of Zoo and Aquariums, they see over 170 million people a year. So, we have a, not only do we have the ability to provide new and added and needed science to conservation of a lot of species. But we have the wherewithal to reach out and to help change the community's attitudes and pressures. We want to inspire them to be conservation-oriented. And so when you look at uh, a lot of conservation organizations and they talk about, well, you know, there's, there, I've got this website up and I've got that website up. And we found this out about Pangolin, too. The only ones going to the Pangolin sites were those people that already knew about Pangolin. Right, Bill. You bring up the probably the biggest point of one of the reasons why I wanted to do this podcast is that even me, I was a zoology major. I had not even heard of a pangolin, at least that I can remember, of until about six or seven years ago. And I, you know, I'm an animal dork, so I can't even imagine somebody that maybe just loosely a fan of animals of of even here in knowing about a pangolin, let alone knowing what, knowing about its conservation and trafficking issues. Oh yeah. So and, the and the you said something. That, you said something that was really good because I've experienced it too. And and most of the public, when I walk out in our zoo, that what I would say, would you like to see a pangolin? Their first comment was, well, I've already seen penguin. Right. And right, you, you were absolutely right. right when you said that when we started our our podcast. That's the lack of knowledge that's out there that we can provide to create a groundswelling of people who can then help change regulations and help change uh, reinforcement of, of regulations to deal with. It, it's not so much habitat now for the pangolin as it is its use, and that's regulatory. Sure. Mm-hmm. So we think we well, have a lot to offer in that avenue as well. And so now... if. 170 million new people, let's say, because of the uh, efforts of the Pangolin Consortium and the AZA institutions as a whole, educating people on this animal and its plight in the wild. If they find out about a pangolin, what can the average person do to help pangolin conservation? Well, um, I will tell you this. You know, we talked about the pressures of pangolin being primarily the the driver demand for them in Asia and Southeast Asia. Believe it or not, North America is a consumer of pangolin scales. Um, <clears throat> what? Oh yeah, uh, there are still oh, a number of that's got to change. There are a number of communities, Chinese and Asian communities in North America. Oh, that's and true. Right. Products yeah. are still shipped in and sold in traditional medicine shops. The the scales used to be used as guitar picks. Believe it or not. Uh, so. Oh my. <laughs> so I play guitar casually. I, I haven't had time in years because of school and children, uh, and pets, but. I couldn't even imagine using a pangolin <laughs> scale so as a guitar pick. So don't do it if any of my listeners are out there. Ay ay ay. Well, and and so being able to provide this information can change people's patterns of behavior. Uh, of course. Products that yeah. the user don't use to move them away from what they think may be traditional medicines that really aren't doing anything for you. 
the other thing yes, too is yeah. Let, we can drive them to we can drive them through our memberships to websites where they can either donate their time, donate funds to help uh, add to the field efforts, to add to the research that's going on over there uh, that would help conserve pangolin in general. Um, we do things here like we've already sent scale. Now they shed their scales uh, periodically mm-hmm. throughout throughout the year. We provided scales now to uh, fish and wildlife, uh, and they are looking at training dogs to be able to snip out pangolin scales. Um, Excellent! I, I love it. And, you know, and, yeah. And so tightening up, uh, tightening up regulations, tightening up uh, the port of entries and the port of exits to find smuggled animals. Uh, you know, we can we can aid in that area as well. Um, but just getting a, a global awareness of the problem is the first step in changing culture. And, yes, and that's, no, I agree definitely. Yeah, that's what the problem for the pangolin really is, is culture. The use of the pangolin byproducts and the fact that uh, that needs to change. Yeah, I think if anything, I mean, uh, will probably agree with me, I think the two biggest... The two biggest messages about pangolin conservation is, number one, there is no scientific evidence that pangolin scales, whether you eat them or drink them or chop them up, whatever you do with them, they do not provide any, I repeat, any medical, psychological, whatever it is, benefit to the consumer. And then secondly, I think the other big thing is to... Tell everyone you know that you learned about a pangolin today. Get everybody in your Facebook feed or on your Instagram. I think that's what the younger kids are using. <laughs> um, whatever it is, is share, share this knowledge. Get yourself and friends excited about the pangolin because it's such a unique, cool creature. If you haven't already during, um, during this podcast, make sure and uh, Google a pangolin not a penguin, and just take a good look at what they look like, and maybe you can describe it better than Bill and or I. Send us send us in a message, and we could put it up on our on our website because they are they're just very very unique. They're the only mammal with scales, and they definitely are in desperate need of our help and education. And getting the information out there is something that anybody can do sitting on their couch with their smartphone, and that's why we live in such an amazing time and generation, especially this young generation. They really have a chance to make large movements uh, just through their technology and devices. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And we we have a website. You can go to our website for the consortium is pangolinconservation.com. Uh, or you can also go to IUCN's uh, Pangolin Specialist Group website and learn more about Pangolin and the efforts that are occurring uh, by the Pangolin Specialist Group as well. Yes, and I highly recommend to the listeners, if you have not um, already liked Brookfield Zoo on Facebook and or followed them on Instagram, really take time to look at Brookfield's website by typing in czs.org. As you can learn about, of course, the, the numerous species that they have, the amount of research and conservation and education programs are just phenomenal. One of the top institutions in the country, in my opinion, uh, about what they do both in the field and then, of course, on grounds. And they have a really great amount of information about the pangolins, the white-bellied tree pangolins that they have under their care. So it's a really interactive site, and you'll learn a lot. So please check them out. And before I let you go, Bill, I have one last very important question for you. Sure. Do you happen to be hiring any recently graduated <laughs> scientists? <laughs> well, we're we're always hiring something. Um, <laughs> we okay. have a very we have a very robust research department. And, I uh, know, I know. Trust me, I yeah. uh, I, I definitely am always I'm always checking out your job board and uh, trying to make connections. So. Uh, uh, but no, thank you for your time. And I'm sure you and I will definitely stay in touch. And I will keep our listeners updated too about all the great progress that the Pangolin Consortium is doing. So please stay tuned. Uh, I 
feel it sounds like there's going to be some great things happening this year as far as births and we're just really excited for you and bill i sincerely from the bottom of my heart i appreciate your time and i potentially on another podcast or perhaps me and you and okay we'll have to uh i would love to hear some stories about the zoo and um the days of how it used to be versus how it is now. So uh, you're a wealth of knowledge and a kind uh, man, and I just really appreciate your time. Well, thank you very much. I've, I've enjoyed this, and uh, I think you do a great service out there, and uh, being able to reach a, a, an audience that uh, normally wouldn't acquire this type of information. So uh, you, should, uh, you should be congratulated and thanked for what you're doing. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. And well, it's teamwork, right? Absolutely. Uh, it's not going to be one person. It's not going to be, I've even, as I've been diving this podcast, I've learned that it's not just going to be wildlife biologists or um, zoological staff members. It's going to be the photographers, the wildlife videographers, the um, arts and technology, people that actually can make computer programs to help us track wildlife better, um, both inside of a zoo or out in the wild. And so it's, it's, it's going to be a lot, it's got to be a lot of people coming together globally to help the pangolin and other species that um, are critically endangered or endangered. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Bill. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, you have a wonderful day and enjoy Chicago springtime weather. I know that's just some of the best. (laughs) Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye.